Hello and welcome to another Amash Project Archives series. This is still with the 2013 conference that was held in Nottingham's Belgrave Rooms, which are held in the Masonic Hall, bringing light to the spurious or somewhat darkness. This episode, we present Ellis Taylor. Ellis is a lifelong experiencer and the range of his experiences are pretty amazing. And it just shows you the, the enormous differentials that are involved in what experiences go through. Also, he has experiences at an Andrews property with her and her family. So it does really seem to bear out the fact that Anne says that her property is built on ley lines and they seem to converge there. And the activity there seems again to be multi-layered and level. So hear a little bit about that from Ellis. He kicks off with though a look at the press, the integrity of the press. And I think we can all agree in mainstream press, there's not much integrity left in that department, but he cites their journals and their protocols. You can have a look at this and see what you think. Enjoy, Ellis Taylor. The next person I'd like to introduce you to is Ellis Taylor, long-time experiencer, and Ellis is also quite a well-known author, and I let him tell you about his books and what he's been doing, and, and also the other areas that his experiences have taken him to, like symbology and numerology, and how this all interweaves into this amazing subject. I would also just like to draw your attention before Ellis comes up, for those who would like to, just to go and have a look at three sculptings in the corner of the room. They are the work of an experiencer and I think they're incredibly powerful. He's absolutely terrified even being here today. So I'm not even going to mention his name, but when you see him sitting next to them, maybe you just, um, you know, give him a hug. <laughs> All right, please welcome Ellis Taylor. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Ellis Taylor. I'm used to walking around a bit when I talk. If I fall off the stage, you'll have to... <laughs> don't laugh too much anyway. The title of my talk is A Life in the Days. It, in, the days actually applies to this world. It's not what the experiencer is in. The way, I, the way I see it is that this world is not what we think it is. I'll go into that more in a minute. But first of all, I'd just like to play a short video clip of a lady who some of you will know, who lives in Australia. She's actually English. She runs an abductee support group herself. Her name's Mary Rodwell. Well, she'll explain in the clip the relationship that uh, we've had, so. I'm Mary Rodwell and I'm director of a CERN, which is the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network. I met Ellis really at the, almost the beginning of my working in this whole field of the paranormal and, and anomalous experiences. And really Ellis was in fact instrumental, I would say, and almost a catalyst for me being involved in this whole phenomena, which is the contact UFO phenomena and people who've had experiences, because Ellis had those experiences and came to me talking about them and said, look, I've come because you're open-minded, but I, you know, my, me and my family are having these experiences and there's no one to talk to, because most people think you're just a loony. And he said, there's no support groups for this. So basically, I was shown a whole new world of um, extraordinary experience that although I'd heard a little bit about in my eclectic reading, I'd never met anyone who'd had these experiences. And I hadn't realized actually how common they actually were. But Ellis, really, because he came over so articulately and so informative, grounded with his experiences, had a powerful effect on how I treated people with that experience because I could see that he was quite sane, he was quite grounded and yet could articulate these so well. He's written his book Dogged Days which explains in, in you know, his journey through these, these particular experiences but also how it's got him to question everything. Everything to do with what's hidden and covered up and we know that even with the UFO phenomena how much of it we're not told about by those that do know the reality that UFO um, it, the UFO experience of having contact and going on craft is absolutely real. And Ellis was one of those that's had these experiences. But not only that, I think it's, it's inspired him to look at what's um, been held 
hidden from us in so many ways. And I often said to Ellis when he started his, you know, when he was doing his journey, the uncovering the hidden, I said, are you ever really fearful? Because I know his site's been explored by a lot of these different secret agencies and what have you. And I said, have you ever been, you know, really frightened? And he said to me, you know, Mary, he said, no, I haven't, because he said, that's what I'm here to do. He said, and I know that. And he said, they've done it before in other lifetimes, they've taken me out. And he says, and if they take me out this lifetime, he said, I'll just do it again. In other words, he's going to come back. He knew that that's what he had to do. And that's why I have so much respect and admiration for Ellis and his research, because it comes from the heart, it comes from that inner part of himself that really seeks truth. And in that, how can you but respect that? And what he has to say, I believe, has an integrity and, ha and is an amazing way of opening up your world and mine to what we really need to know about ourselves, our world and this universe. OK, I'd just like to read something to begin with. It's my thoughts on this at the moment. Once upon a time, not very long ago, embedded science proclaimed that everyone in the kingdom must believe. That only the Barmy claimed it was possible for one to see, hear, or speak with someone who was out of earshot and eyesight. They told them they must believe it was impossible to analyse stars, that meteorites could not come from space, that heavier than air flight was impossible. And so was space flight and harnessing nuclear energy and superconductivity and black holes and creating force fields and invisibility and teleportation and on and on and on. Things that we know are possible now and we're doing it. Most of those examples come from this book by scientist Michel Kaku. But this I think is very important for everybody to live your own truth. And so long as you're true to yourself and you're true about everything about your life then everything around you will become the same. True. In the scheme of things, I suspect that the function of order, ordained science is to demonstrate not the pinnacles of humankind's progress, but rather the current density of its senses. From what I can make of it in the world, ordained science has another role as well, to provide a misleading yet seemingly authoritative reference and excuse for the presence and shadowed misbehaviour of those who are intent on controlling and disposing of them. Only in scant ways do encounter experiences accord with materialistic science and its dogmas of limitation and expectation. Instead, our other world interactions teach us, in the most efficient way, experientially, how, they are, how there are, in fact, no barriers. Solidity, time, distance and space are all, in truth, illusions. Everything is temporary according to its role and infinite from the perspective of this domain in its possibilities. Which means that no outright truth can be gauged or measured here. Perhaps not even sought. Very likely it can only be arrived at. The material scientist demands repeatability but how can that happen given the ever-changing, subtle vagaries permeating the field of this realm, as well as the mysterious entanglements we have with the others? Exact same circumstances can never occur more than once. Ordained science is itself, when I hold it up to the light of my own personal experiences, supernatural, according to this dictionary definition, which is of pertaining to or being above or beyond what is natural, unexplainable by natural law or phenomena. It's abnormal. Whereas what many of us here experience is natural and normal. Life is unpredictable and more intricate than we can contemplate or imagine. And what I've learned is that every being has its own individual quest designed and intermittently predestined. And in many ways, we're all participants in something akin to a war on, in, by, and through consciousness. We interact with realms and others where the chains of the 3D laws of science only apply to those who believe in them. 
The impossible of conventional science can only exist if the inside of its structured, maintained and chained paradigm is all there is. But as there cannot be an inside without an outside, shouldn't people be asking questions about what lies beyond? Like all belief systems, the scientific world view is only a limited and limiting theory that depends for its validity on ignoring, dismissing and disparaging everything and everyone that doesn't fit into it. What is it that this enslaving, enforced belief system doesn't want people to know? And why doesn't it want humanity to know? What we experience as encounter challenges and scatters to the winds, the very foundations that embedded science has built its precious castles in the air upon. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are here to dissolve those chains. Those amongst us who are genuine speak out to enlighten and inform because we know in our hearts that we have to, despite the ever-present dangers to our well-being of doing so. We offer our hearts and we bear our souls to the world because what we are sharing with everyone who is ready to listen is unquestionably to do with the most pressing and literally vital truth facing the continuance and welfare of humanity and this world. And it really is the biggest secret. Of course, as light surfaces, darkness descends, aiming to infiltrate or swoop in from the other side. It hasn't escaped my notice that as more of us have been awakening to our purpose, and speaking publicly about our encounters and other world journeys, so too has the dark side rallied. There are hoaxers, tricksters, manipulators, plants and liars, masquerading and muddy in the waters. But also there are, helped along by the corrupted institutions of religion, media, education and government, etc. Scale-eyed members, some from the clinical wing of the bat, who have been witlessly declaring that God is hokey. There is a God, a supreme creator, however you want to term it, neither male nor female. Perhaps all of us who share these experiences know that. I know I do. And we are just as acutely aware of the dark side, the dog and pony, dual personality that I call the darkness invisible. The ghost in the machine of the grand design emanating from God's dream. For a long time now, this darkness has directed our world through its offices of control, and it has always done this subliminally, through the powerful forces of fear and temptation, hiding in the light and the voice of the great spirit from those who fall for its alluring promises and threats until in their blindness they proclaim, there is no intelligent designer, there is no great spirit. But just as the sky at night, even in the blackest departments of the darkness, Points of light do shine out, and from the paradigm control department science recently came this. Yet more evidence emerges that our universe is a grand simulation created by an intelligent designer. And a new scientific paper published in Ar ARCX IVE and co-authored by Silas Bean from the University of Bonn reveals strong statistical evidence that our reality is indeed a grand computer simulation if you want to have a look at that, you can see that on the internet. But then who would really be stupid enough to believe that the five physical senses of human beings are capable of perceiving everything around us? That's the very slim range of our sight compared to what is possible. And those arrows go both ways infinitely. And the range of our hearing in the physical sense. Yet science tells us that this is all nonsense, that we, what we see, what we feel, what we encounter, what we experience, that is unusual to their box, that we're making it up, we're believers and all this kind of nonsense. I'm not a believer, I experience things. That, you know, I didn't believe that I drove here to Nottingham to give this talk, I know I did, it's the same thing. I wonder if the people who first used microscopes and telescopes 
face the same amount of ridicule as those who began capturing life outside our physical senses, abilities, with digital cameras. These are just some shots that were taken of other world creatures with digital cameras. And these were taken with 35 mil cameras. That's the energy beam there going into my office. Someone looking at me. And that's an energy beam that I caught in sequence at a place called St Necton's Glen in Cornwall. Other obstacles to humanity's awareness of reality include everything and everyone with a name or a date of birth or manifestation, but I won't go into that now. But dishonourable mentions also include education, religion, science and the media, especially the news, which tragically in the now waning mainstream, when it comes to their rare reporting and documenting of matters that dispute the scientific fabrication, stands for no evidence will suffice, despite the codes that they should be abiding by. These are the codes. Public enlightenment is the forerunner of justice and the foundation of democracy, hear, hear. The duty of the journalist is to further those ends by seeking truth and providing a fair and comprehensive account of events and issues. Conscientious journalists from all media and specialities strive to serve the public with thoroughness and honesty. Professional integrity is the cornerstone of a journalist's credibility. And this is from the journalist creed. The public journal is a public trust that all connected with it are, to the full measure of responsibility, trustees for the public. That all acceptance of lesser service than the public service is betrayal of that trust. This again is from the Society of Professional Journalists. Tell the story of the diversity and magnitude of the human experience boldly, even when it's unpopular to do so. Examine their own cultural values and avoid imposing those values on others. Avoid stereotyping by race, gender, age, religion, ethnicity, geography, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance or social status. Recognise a special obligation to ensure that the public's business is conducted in the open and that the government records are open to inspection. The journalist codes call for truthfulness, accuracy, objectivity, impartiality, fairness and public accountability. How does all this equate with the sniggering, piss taking, defamation and general displayed ignorance that the vast majority of media pieces descend into when they deal with anything to do with experiences that don't fit into the sanctioned circus? Now to talk about it once again is Tribune transportation writer John Hilkovich who wrote the story. And John, the response has been, well, out of this world, hasn't it? Yes, it has been astronomical, Jim. Uh, every major country, it seems, people have written in, uh, both those who claim they've uh, spotted UFOs during their life as well as serious researchers. I mean, just the last two days, this oh. is my email. And these are the serious emails, uh, you know, the ones from kooks who said they were brought aboard alien spacecraft I put in a circular file. Why does television in particular use such devices as editorial trickery, if not to shepherd their viewers' opinions? I'm speaking from experience, by the way. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, Other World Journeys, you'll see a, an example of that. Here's another passage from the journalist creed. I believe that a journalist should write only what he holds in his heart to be true. Now, to hold something in one's heart requires a depth of awareness connection and integrity. It calls for more than what one thinks or thinks they know. It calls for empathy and it calls for intuition. But even then I ask you this intellectually, how can you be sure that something is not true if you've never had experience of it yourself or studied the intricacies of the subject properly? Here's another caution from the SPJ. Test the accuracy of information from all sources and exercise care to avoid inadvertent error. Deliberate distortion is never permissible.
You could probably go to the moon and back walking on genuine accounts and footage to do with the reality of the subjects we're covering today. Sorry, the evidence is both profound and profuse, yet the media all across the world displays the same attitude of propaganda, denial and derision when it comes to human contact with other worlds. It's fair to say that it must be difficult to comprehend other world interactions if one hasn't experienced them personally. And I understand that. And I understand that everyone can, and many people do. Having pointed out all this, please don't assume that I'm tarring every member of the media with the same brush. I'm well aware there are, and have always been, many extremely diligent, brave and talented men and women in the media. It is, like ours, a perilous task for the honest, and I pay those people due respect. Here's one book on the courage of some journalists. You might like to uh, get hold of that. It's Silence by David Dadge. During my life, I've met some great journos, but I've also had my run-ins with some lesser members of the media, and boy, do they close ranks. That was one story in the Oxford Times that was utter crap about me. The guy went away. He's a very big name at the Oxford Times. He went away, wrote this article, having not spoken one word to me. It was complete bunkum. So who did the Frau serve? Not truth. We're not alone. We never were and we never will be. And it's high time for us to acknowledge this most fundamental and vital fact. We're not lonely accidents of ex an explosive cosmic scramble and our lives are not meaningless, inconsequential aftershocks. Every life, every life, is an infinite experiential opportunity lived in a busy, populated multiverse. And its limits can only be described by the binds of our fears. Besides the myriad forms of life that share this frequency range of our manifestation are others, countless others. Some of these others come and go between their worlds and ours, as we all do in theirs, to varying degrees and circumstances, whether we realise it or not. Some of them have an agenda and a point to their communications, and they leave their marks. Anyway, that song was A Day in the Life, for those who don't know. It was performed by the Beatles. It was mostly written by John Lennon, who was himself no bystander when he came to the subjects we're discussing today. The line, somebody spoke and I went into a dream, is kind of very apt, actually, to a lot of us here. It was Paul's, or should I say Falls, who also claims to have had a number of mystical encounters and inspirations. If you see a little note on walls and bridges, it says, I saw a UFO. And I was just finished doing walls and bridges. I'd mastered it or done the last tape of it. And I was really just relaxed and feeling good. And it was summer in New York and I had the window open. And lo and behold, there was this thing just hovering sort of a hundred yards away. But I saw it so close, it wasn't in the sky or nothing, you know. And it was like, I could have hit it with a brick if I'd thrown a stone at it. I couldn't see the colours because it was dusk. It was a good clear summer night, you know, the sky was very clear. And round the bottom of it were just ordinary looking electric light bulbs, blinking off and on alternatively, like on a billboard or something. And on the top of it was a red light. And the thing I noticed was that there was no noise and I could hear that freeway down below, all the cars going. So I realised, oh, it's not a helicopter, then it must be a balloon. It was so close to the rooftop that it couldn't be a balloon. It was, so all the rational things I went through, say, not a helicopter, a balloon. Not a balloon, it's too close to the roof. It's, and it's manoeuvring too well to be a balloon. So I just watched it, and it, it was there for about five or ten minutes. It went off down the East River, and uh, there it was. And that's all I've got to say about it. So that was John Lennon talking about his UFO sighting. But did he just see a UFO? Did more happen to him that night? May Pang, his girlfriend at the time who shared the experience, also witnessed the UFO, as did a number of people who phoned police and newspapers that night, as told to Larry Warren, that John had told her he had been abducted when he was a child. According to Yuri Geller, Lennon, had a much closer personal experience than he's never, that he's ever made public, when a band of four ETs showed up in his apartment and gave him a metal egg. Geller claims 
that he now has the egg. John Lennon didn't ring the newspapers, no surprise there. I'm not going to call up the newspapers and say, this is John Lennon, I saw a flying saucer last night, because he knew exactly what would happen. John Lennon, who sang, Give Peace a Chance, was gunned down outside his home by a man whose name meant dealer in war, Mark Chapman. I've written a book about my experiences um, called Doggy Day. I'd first like to tell you about some missing time experiences. Mary, who I introduced my talk with speaking on there, she was over in, in England on holiday um, and she had to go back to North Walsham in Norfolk to her parents' house. She was holiday in England, as I said, but we were spending time driving around and, and she asked me to take her back. So I did, but at the same time, I phoned Anne, who's, who spoke last, and asked if I could visit them afterwards. And so we agreed that I would. So on the 5th of August, 2004, I drove to North Walsham with Mary and I dropped her off at her friend's house, half past three. And they said to me, it'll take you about an hour and a bit to get to Anne's house from here. Actually, before I drove off, I, I phoned Anne and said, look, I'm, I'm going to be with you soon, um, but I'll phone you as soon as I get to the other side of Kings Lynn. I drove off about half past three and uh, I was driving along the road and um, suddenly this, I felt like I needed to pull into a lay-by. There's this lay-by there and I just drove in there. I drove behind this, this, this white box truck. That's just a map of North Walsham. So I'm approaching Kings Lynn and I see this, this lay-by and I pull in and behind this box truck, I, I phone Anne and say, oh, just the other side of Kings Lynn, I won't be too long now. Yeah, okay. And Anne said that was at 4.15. So that makes sense. It was, a, it was a van like this and it had a name on the side and I couldn't remember the name that was on the side of the van for a long time after this. I put the phone down, drove out of the lay-by and as I got to the entrance to the main road, a, very, a, a van exactly the same was coming towards me this way and it had the name on the front as well. And it was exactly the same van. I can't remember if the van that, that was there when I first got there was there or not, but it must have been or I would have noticed that. Drove off and I, f I felt really odd, really strange. And, and I kept driving and, and, I, and I got to Kings Lynn and, and you had to sort of divide into two lanes, one, one for going left and one for going straight on. And I knew I had to go straight on, but instead I got in the left-hand lane and went to go left and then suddenly realised, no, I'm going the wrong way. So I indicated and sort of somebody let me in and I got in and carried on. And I got to a place called Sutton Bridge, which is about five minutes from where Anne lives. And, it, and it's, it's a kind of a drawbridge or something like that for letting ships through. And as I approached it, I saw these two signs on my side of the road, one above the other. Uh, and I thought, wow, that means I can't go across the bridge. So I hauled on the brakes and all these cars behind me were screaming and, well, bibbing everyone and all this sort of stuff. And I was really didn't know where I was. And I thought, and then these cars started coming over from the other side and I thought to myself, well, I must be able to go across there. So I really slowly went across and it was all fine. And I drove to Anne's, like I said, about five minutes away from there. And I pulled into Anne's and Anne came out of her kitchen. And I said, oh, can I use the phone? Because I, I told my girlfriend I'd phone her at five o'clock. And she said, it's 20 to seven. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow I'd lost like these all this time, two hours or something like that of time. And I've got no memory of what happened during that space. But yeah, I mean, things at Anne's house, as she explained earlier, it's dead genuine. This is a real, real strange place. And, and if you're somebody who has these experiences yourself anyway, and you go there, then it's just amplified and, and, and you're almost guaranteed to have something very odd happen there and, and sometimes quite scary. <laughs> that isn't the only incident of missing time that I've had on my way to Anne's. But anyway, this is uh, my, my thinking about it. I'm, I'm kind of I'm looking on the map at this place where this lay-by is and, and there it is. And it's actually on right at the turn in to Sandringham, which is a bit odd because 
I've done a lot of research into missing children in my life and written about it and the strange kind of involvements then, if you will, with royal family and their palaces and, and how ley lines seem to mix. Ley lines that go through places where missing children are taken and found actually do go through their royal residences as well and, and it's all very peculiar. It was very odd that on Lunasa, which is an ancient energy time and put it that way i happened to park in this lay-by and, and have this mysterious event happen to me that involved a van that i can't remember the name of but was very very familiar to me the name and it was near this near sandringham castle i spent two years trying to think of what this name can be you know it, it, i knew it was important and then this film came, uh, the TV film about the Moors murders came on, See No Evil, you may have seen it. It's creepy and horrible stuff. I watched it. In one scene, the sister of Myra Hindley was crossing the road with a pram and this van came. And this van <laughs> was the van that I'd seen with the name on it. And the name was, it just meant this replica. So that tied all that in again as well, the missing children, the murdered children, the royal family, the reptilians, blah, 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 all the rest of it, all came together in that one thing. And do you know what? I watched a DVD of that film and they've taken that scene out. That's not unusual. I've also seen other things happen in um, films. I've seen orbs. There was a film called uh, Jesse James, The Outlaw, or something like that, and he was standing in a bedroom, and an orb came, this is in the film, I watched it on the aeroplane. This orb came out from underneath the bed, flew around and went up there. Somehow that got into that cup, but you won't see it in the DVD you find now. It's a different version on the aeroplane. And then also in the recent Sherlock Holmes series, you're, there's, and I've got it on the DVD, they left it in the DVD, there's an orb that actually comes and flies around in that as well. So they didn't cut that one out. I was born in Australia and when I was very little, we came to live in England. I stayed at my nan's house in Oxford. I was probably about three. I, I was nearly three when I moved there. So it was around about three. I start, the door used to open in the middle of the night and this really weird face used to look through and go, <laughs> the door like, and disappeared behind the door again. I don't think it frightened me so much, it intrigued me. Then we went to this place called Sandbanks on holiday. Uh, it was just for the day, I think, actually. Someone said, oh, let's go and see the Punch and Judy show. So off we, off we went, saw the Punch and Judy show, and of course, you recognise who that character was. It was, it was Punch, and it, that did make me feel, I, I went off crying. Um, but Sandbanks was another really weird place because I had a period of missing time there. My mum and dad and my nan and gramp searched me for three quarters of an hour and couldn't find me. I just vanished. I got no recollection of what happened there either. But somebody just found me and brought me back. Yeah, talking about the bloodline theme, I've only put this in here because oh, of it. My family are um, an old Pictish family from Scotland, baronial family. They were lords and ladies, had their own all that sort of nonsense. They emigrated, or, or one branch emigrated to Australia, and one became the Lord Mayor of Perth, and the other was the first Australian baron. And he was the Prime Minister of Australia, well, acting Prime Minister of Australia, and Prime Minister of Western Australia. And he was, of, they were both very famous explorers. And then when we came over from England to Australia, we came on the SS Orcades and um, apparently when we were in the Gulf of Aden or something like that, I vanished for three quarters of an hour then as well and the whole ship was looking for me and then I just turned up. 29th of September uh, 2006, I went to visit Anne again in Long Sutton and at this time I, I drove from Oxford and I'm going along the A43 and I thought, oh, there might be a traffic jam along the way. I need to go to the loo just in case there is, you see, because you don't want to get stuck in a car in a traffic jam and need a piece. So, and then this kind of sign said service station. So I drove up this hill into this service station. There's all the sort of usual stuff that a service station has, except there weren't any cars there. <laughs> it's just a service station. This is about two o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. Should have been absolutely rampacked. There was nobody there. <laughs> except for a few cars right down the end at a hotel. Anyway, so I get out of the car and I walk into this, you know, service station place. There's nobody there, just empty, right? But there's, a, there's like a fast food McDonald's beef burger type place there, right by the door. And I was looking for signs for the loo, but there weren't any. 
And I was sort of looking around and not a soul about to ask. And then from like the back there, this guy came around with this big full tray of all this food. He didn't take his eyes off me. He stared at me all the way and he's put it down on the thing and he, he started eating his food, looking at me. No, so, so I didn't know where to look. So I, I kind of carried on looking for the, looking for the signs and, and there was nothing there. And I walked to the front and I couldn't see anything there. Walked to the back, couldn't see anything there. Came back to the front and there were two youths there, like in, in the uniforms of a fast food place. And one was a boy, one was a girl. I went to the, went to the boy and I said, uh, oh, could you tell me where the loo's are? He said, yeah, come with me. And he took me around the back of the counter. That's right. <laughs> yeah, there was a, I went to the loo and I came out. It's a bit odd, you know, well, that's where the kitchen should be, surely. Anyway, I, I came out and there's still nobody there. Anyway, I got in my car, drove off and I thought, I wonder if I had some missing time now. It was really weird. But the clock on the car didn't say that I had. So whether I did, and I don't know. But I did feel strange and I drove off towards Anne's. I also had to visit the post office in Long Sutton near, near Anne's, about five minutes from Anne's, because I had to get my road tax. Went to get the road tax and the stamp on the, or the receipt said 4.46 p.m. So we had that. Got in the car, drove to Anne's and, and on the way there, get to the crossroads. This is the crossroads before you get to Anne's. And this, this crossroads seems to be a, a bit of a portal. It's a really odd place. I get there, right, and everything's fine. The light's something like this, you know, it's similar to this. And it's pitch black, it's dark. <laughs> Can't see a flipping thing. Anyway, I eventually get through and I walk, walk in and I knock on the door, ring the bell or whatever it is, and, and Anne comes to the door and in I go. To, and Paul said, why didn't you park in the drive? I said, well, it was just a bit too dark, I couldn't see where I was going, you know. Anyway, that get in, and, and Anne had had this new conservatory put on the uh, house and, and went into the conservatory. And I was feeling really odd, but anyway, I walked in, I bang in headache. And then there was Mike, and then there was Fran, that's Mike Horam, Fran is partner, and then Paul and Anne, you were standing there, I think. And I walked in, and I saw somebody run past the back window. No, it's just Anne, that's right. And I saw somebody run past the back window. I said, oh, was that Paul just run to lock the chickens away? And she said, no, Paul's in the kitchen and we haven't got the chickens anymore. <laughs> but somebody ran past and then it started hammering with rain. You couldn't even hear yourself speak. Something really sort of peculiar happened in between. You know, I mean, it'd gone from light in a matter of 100 yards or something to complete darkness. We, we went into the living room and we carried on chattering and then got to about midnight. I was going to be sleeping in Jason's room because Paola had vacated it. Sasha turned up, so Sasha had Jason's room and I slept on the couch. Now the couch is like immediately below where Sasha slept. Anyway, everybody went off to bed. I lay down, Anne had actually said, do you want to sleep in the, in the conservatory? It's much more comfortable, you see. And I, I, for some reason, I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not sleeping in there. So I slept on the, on the couch. And I had my back to, like, there's a coffee table there, I had my back to it. And all of a sudden I heard all this scratching and really loud on the window somewhere. And, and it was, I don't know whether it was the back window or from the conservatory door or whatever, but it's loud scratching. And I just felt so dog, I thought, please leave me alone, I'm not afraid tonight, I really don't want to. Next minute I hear all these things shifting around on the coffee table, just right next to me, moving around. And, and then I could hear all this garbled voices and lights flashing around and all this weird stuff going on. And then this, I saw this little girl's face and it was just a face and then it went right into, right close to mine and turned into this demonic looking bloody thing. Excuse the swearing. Next minute, oh yeah, something shot into my head and it seemed like it was squeezing my brain and it bloody hurt it did. And, and the next, next minute I, I found myself standing at the back door and it was pitch black and I was looking outside and I saw something moving down there and it was a great big dog with flecks of white on it and it, and it rose up. And as it rose up, this other dog came along, exactly the same sort of dog and it rose up too. And, it, and one dog, the first dog sort of knocked it out of the way and, and it started chewing on my fingers. It wasn't biting, it was like really hard pressing, ever so hard. But then it was light. The, the, I think the clock chimed or something and it was light and I was back lying on the sofa. I got up and went to the loo and as I got to the top of the stairs I saw that Jason's bedroom door was open and Sasha was up and making the bed or something. I said, you all right, Sasha? And she said, 
I've had a terrible night. I just just go to the loo and we go downstairs, have a cup of tea and we talk about it. And uh, so we did that. And she said that she felt like she was wrapped in something like cling film, feeling really, really terrible. As soon as I mentioned about the dog, she said, oh my God, the dogs, yeah, look what they've done. They've been biting my hand. And, and then she said, no, they were biting that hand, but how come all the bite marks are on the other hand? And it was very, very odd. So that's Paula Harris with some geezer. That's Jason's room. Now that corner where the orbs are is where everything comes out of that corner. That's the portal. That's the front of my book, just the, the dog chewing on my fingers. <coughs> Sasha's hand. For that experience, for the next, over a week, I didn't even need to shave. My hair stopped growing and, my, and the hair in, in, on my head was falling out in clumps. I felt like... Um, I felt really peculiar as if like I was two people and I started saying things that I didn't actually believe in. I had burns across there as well, that's right. But yeah, I mean, we got through it, didn't we? Here's another ex missing time experience. I went to give a talk in uh, Blackpool in Probe. Um, I went with another friend, he's an ex secret services, military, all that kind of stuff. We were driving towards, like I said, from Oxford to Lancashire. And we decided we'd get, go on the M6 toll road. And, and as soon as we got on the toll road, we thought, oh, we'll stop at the service station, get a cup of tea and, you know, have a bit of a rest. We were looking for the service station and the service station didn't arrive. <laughs> Next minute we knew we were on the ordinary M6. I don't know how we paid for the toll. We were on the ordinary M6 and following this big dark van that we'd seen earlier at a service station near Oxford with the license plate CIA something or other. And then I get to, um, to probe and give a talk and a lady in the audience sees things happening to me and takes these photographs. And this lady's a professional photographer and that's exactly how I looked when she photographed me on the stage talking. And there's all sorts of weird stuff around me that you may be able to see from there on the big screen. The screen looks, it looks like I'm kind of part of the screen or something, I don't know. And there's, there's entities in there and all sorts. Whatever that thing is there, that thing there wasn't there in reality, whatever it is. There's a face here that wasn't there. There's someone behind me, it looks like, but it's all very weird and it seems like they all come together in a very strange picture. But as I said, this lady, I've got her letter. Um, she explains what exactly happened. She's actually a medium herself as well. Very elderly lady, very lovely lady, but it frightened her because um, the previous time that I'd spoken there, a guy had dropped dead in the, uh, while giving a talk. She reckons that she could see him in the photograph she took. I've tried to kind of uh, manipulate the photograph in my amateur way because there are faces and things there. You may be able to see that one there. There's a big old face there. But there are other things in them as well. This was a photograph um, somebody took of me giving the talk and there's this strange thing happening at the back of this guy's neck. Whatever that is, I don't know. But when I actually walked up to the stage to give, give the presentation, I, I felt like things were swooping down on me. It's very peculiar feeling going up there and, I, and things, I did feel odd up there for sure. And like I was under attack in some way. This is a photograph of me talking. <laughs> taken by an audience member and this black shape <laughs> appeared in the photograph. Blocking me off completely, I'm somewhere down there anyway. This was an interesting thing. I, I was living in Australia and came over on holiday in 97, I think. In 97, in 97 and I wanted to see this Julia set crop circle because it really, really sort of grabbed a hold of me. So I went to Stonehenge and I was walking around Stonehenge, not the way that they've laid it out, that you have to walk around anti-clockwise. I walked around clockwise and everybody else is coming this way and I'm kind of dodging them and they're dodging me and they're tutting and stuff because I'm going that way. And this guide came up to me, this lady, and she came up to me and she said, um, you are following the correct direction, the natural flow at this site. And then she said, have you seen the Aubrey holes? And I'd never heard of the Aubrey holes. And I said, no. And she said, well, come with me. And she took me to this Aubrey hole. And for those who don't know, it's, it's, there's 56 of them around Stonehenge and uh, conventional archaeology or whatever says that they're just where they stuck posts in but actually what she said to me is that in the winter we stand on these Aubrey holes because it keeps our feet warm no matter how hot, how cold it is so she said stand on there so I stood on and buzz 
man, the buzz that comes up. And I said to her, can you tell me what field the uh, Julia set crop circle was in? And, and she said, yes, it was that one over there. Do you know what? She said, we were all here. It was very busy that day. The guides were here, every, everybody. One minute there was nothing there, the next minute there it was, and we couldn't believe it. And I've always thought, she said, that it was for me, because my name is Julia. And I told people when I got back to Oxford Crop Circle researchers about this, and no one can find this lady. I'll just show you these photographs. I haven't got time to talk about them, but these are marks that were left on me during a, well, on the first night of a 47 day experience. This is my partner talking about that night. That one particular incident that Ellis is talking about, um, I just remember that very clearly. Um, I, I have to say, I actually um, make cakes and things, so I've always got the camera ready to take photos. So that's why a camera was there, to take the images on his body at that, on that particular day. And um, it, it was just the most bizarre thing. And it, it was almost as if, as soon as the... the the images were taken or the photos were taken within a period of five, maybe ten minutes. The pictures that were on him and the, and the like, impressions, like fingerprints and things, all just disappeared. Um, it was as if we were meant to just take the pictures and then they were gone. You know, I thought at first the picture on his chest, which was quite a bizarre looking uh, image, might have been like sheets, you know, wrinkled up and rolled up into the side of him, but. It was a clear face of something, and there's no ripple marks on his skin, you know, to touch everything was just smooth. You know how when you've got a wrinkle yeah. sheet, you've got that, you know, all the, your skin kind of like ripples a little bit? Yeah, so this wasn't a, this was it's definitely not a, yeah. Nothing like that at all. It was a completely smooth picture that that just was just there, and it was just a bizarre thing. He couldn't actually see, he could see it, but it was an upside down version of what he could see. It wasn't really that clear to him. Now, it wasn't until he got up and had a look in the mirror that he could actually see what I was talking about. That is uh, extremely odd. The, 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 you know, the, the imprints on his uh, arm were definitely long finger marks, and I tried to put my fingers over the top of it to see if it was perhaps me, you know. Mm. But it was nowhere clear. Close to that, it was opposite of my handprint, if you know what I mean. I would have had to have been a contortionist to have had my hand on his arm. In, you know, to make that imprint, if it was me, but it wasn't. It, it's just, yeah, you, you have to actually see it to believe it. And that's why we took the pictures, because I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. That was my former partner, uh, well, my partner's talking to Ben, Emlyn Jones. There's a lot more, obviously, I could show you, but I've got to get on. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much, Joanne, for um, asking me to speak here. Thank you. Thank you very much.